the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One of the traits, I suppose, of the first of the uh, Sunday immediately prior to Christmas, uh, sometimes the joke is made that it doesn't really matter which language you read it in. So, ma so much of it is names. And as long as you've got is born of, then you can read it in whichever language you like. This, this is emblematic of a great plan. It's a plan that started at the foundation of time. Our story of salvation is one that goes right back to Genesis. Right back to Genesis 1. This amazing world was made and humanity was placed in it. And we were the ones who, who brought evil in, who brought sin in, who brought corruption in. And this is already Genesis 3. So this, the idyllic paradise that we were made for lasted for about two chapters. And then you've got the rest of the Bible. And the plan was there. That even though humanity was taken down, even though we were taken down by the deception of the serpent, by this wily insidiousness, the plan was already there. And so I'm not sure if it's technically a prophecy, if it's God that speaks it, but God does speak about the future. And he says, it's quite clear that the time will come when the son of woman, when, we'll come back to that in just a moment, when the son of woman would be, um, would be again bitten by the serpent and that same son would crush the head of the serpent and we come back a couple of thousand years later quite a few thousand years later <coughs> you see you're not supposed to say son of females in, uh, in, in the context in which this was written <coughs> The particular word used is seed of a woman. The only time that you would say that, the only reason that you would say that is because you were saying that it was not the descendant of a human male. This took thousands of years to come true because, well, biology doesn't typically work like that, as, as I'm sure that we know. Biology doesn't work like that. And they the lone counterexample was read in today's gospel reading. This plan for these thousands of years need a lot of patience to see this through. Because so, so many people would not. Abraham was given a great promise that he would be the father of many nations. And he didn't see that, not, not on this earth. He saw one son, who likewise saw a son who would make that prophecy to Abraham true. And so for all these thousands of years, the people of the Old Covenant knew what was, what was coming. Knew the plan that had been set aside for us knew what it was that was going to take us from where we ourselves had placed us and restore us to him. We come a few thousand years later and we hear, we heard the first of the readings <coughs> about Christmas, about the birth of Christ, being spoken in the first chapter of Matthew. And go through the genealogy as it, as it would have been understood, as it would have been traced down the generations 
by the Jewish people because that was the context in which the, uh, the Apostle Matthew was writing for. And, and it trails down all the way through to Joseph. Not everyone, not everyone in that line of succession, so to speak, is what we would expect when we start talking about the appropriate ancestors of the god -man. Who might we be thinking of? Well, we might think of a saint who gave birth to a saint and so on for, for the generations. And that's not the case. You do get saints in that line. But just as I think for many of us, if we were to look at our genealogies, we would, we would find saints and sinners alike. So likewise, when we look at this genealogy, indeed, we can probably find both wrapped up in most of the people, just based on what we know about their life. This plan may not have looked like coming to fruition. We found out more and more about it as time went on, but this plan continued on until the time was right, until the right people were there to make it happen. We, I think, go through a broadly similar process whenever we try to look at our future, to look at what we're going to be offering in response. What can we do? What can we offer for the one who loves us? And what we are offering, well, this ultimately is our plan. While it is true as the, as the proverb says, man proposes, he offers ideas, he proposes, and God disposes. Sometimes these plans are put in the trash. It, it is nonetheless equally true that the, uh, the, the military strategists who will say that the plan leaves as soon as the battle is joined. Yet, nonetheless, you need that plan. For many of us, well, we offer our plan A. And then that gets politely swept to the side. Now what? Well, as we say, there's another 25 letters in the alphabet. Plan B, plan C, plan C, one, two, and three sometimes. And these plans are important because they are what we wish to offer. Even if we're not doing it intentionally, what we wish to offer. How are we offering of the resources that we've been given? The time that we have been given. The time that has been given to us to work out our salvation. The time to offer a response for all that he has done for us. A time not to deny that he's given us anything, but instead to recognize what he has given us and the responsibility that that gives us and to act accordingly. So when we're putting together our plan, and most of us will put together some kind of plan for the year ahead, some sort of resolutions, or even if the plan <coughs> is just pretty much the same as it was last year. That's still a plan. It is, it's not contrary to how a Christian should be for us to have a plan. For us to intend to go in a particular direction. What would be wrong is to insist that our plan A is going to happen. This didn't happen for the God that we worship. This didn't happen for the prophets who served him. This didn't happen all the way down through history. Plan A rarely was the plan that actually happened. 
So it's okay if a few years ago your five-year plan didn't work out as you expected. It's okay if in the year upcoming your one-year plan doesn't work out as you expected. It's probably been worked out for the better. That something somewhere in that just because you had a plan and thought that it was good. I've done this too. That plan wasn't as good as it could have been. It wasn't as real as it really should have been. We can take inspiration from this. That just as God's plan, well, his initial plan didn't work out, what happened next? A new plan was put in. A new plan for us to be saved. For the salvation of all humanity, the restoration of the cosmos. The plans kept coming. The mission was clear. The end point was clear. And so, how we get there? Well, if there's a block in the way, go around the block. There's a speed bump, go over the speed bump. For each of us, our own mission is clear. If we're looking end of life, our mission is clear. We're told quite specifically what is wanted for us. Heaven. That's the only thing that is good enough for what we, each of us, were made for. Our time here is a preparation for that glorious day. Our time here and the plans that we make are how it is that we work out our salvation in fear and trembling. That we work out our salvation with care, with diligence. And even with a little bit of trepidation. That's okay too. It usually means that this matters. time that has been given to us we can use for our salvation for our progress towards holiness so it's appropriate that as we look to Christmas the plan that God has made is at the same time the time when our culture and context looks to the year ahead what happened in the last year what do we wish to continue? What can happen in the year ahead? What do we wish to change or keep the same? Whatever plans we make, whatever resolutions that we make and try to keep, there's one end point that is enough for us as Christians. That is to follow Christ all the way through the doors of the kingdom of heaven. This year is a subset of that journey. A convenient, defined length of time, somewhat arbitrary, that's okay. And for this period of time, how is it that each of us will plan to enact that vision for our life that we have received from above, that we be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? There's many possibilities on how this may be. It would be impossible for me to specify because for each of us it can vary. Maybe you're going to work on that prayer rule. It's been a bit sketchy for a little while, been a bit hit and miss, been a bit short, somehow been less than you want it to be. That's a real good resolution. Maybe it's to more actively steward what you can do. Whether that's more or less, or whether that's fine tuning, being more specific about what you're going to offer. Maybe that's to read scripture. Or maybe 
it's to read that commentary on scripture by a patristic writer that you've always wanted to do, but now you have the impetus to do it, the propulsion to do it. Maybe, as it will be, for quite a number of the people who are, who are here with us, maybe it will be to, it will be to receive the sacraments to be just as much a part of, of the church as every other Orthodox Christian, to be being a part of confession, receiving communion, and making this a part of your life. As I say, there's a great variety. The best way to work out what it might be for yourself is speaking with your confessor and having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. For each of us, let us take stock and let us look ahead. That the plan that God has for us may be put into practice. That this plan, that the earlier plans may be done rather than the contingencies, that we be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth, just as in all of our life, so especially in the year ahead. Amen.